All right, we, uh, we're going to head and get started. It's great to see everybody uh, this morning. Nate and Amanda, it's so good to see you guys from Valley, Alabama, our L.A., Lower Alabama family. It's awesome. It's good to see everybody here. Um, the title of my message this morning, of course, you can already see that, is Righteousness Through Grace. And this is, this is a message that has changed my life. I mean, sincerely changed my life. And uh, I just hope that it does for you what it did for me. Uh, it, it just completely changed the way I see me and I see him through me. So, uh, you know, the, who, who all knows who Yogi Berra is? I'm not talking about, hey, boo-boo. I'm talking about Yogi Berra. Not Yogi Bear, Yogi Berra. Uh, he was, he's a late, great Hall of Famer baseball player, played many years with the New York Yankees, managed the New York Yankees. I'm not a Yankees fan, but... Uh, maybe back then I might have been. Um, managed the Mets for many years. He's in the Hall of Fame. He he had this profound nugget of wisdom that he said one time. And if you're taking notes, you want to write this nugget of wisdom down because it's awesome. He said, if you don't know where you are going, you will wind up somewhere else. I'm done. Y'all can go home. If you don't know where you are going, you will wind up somewhere else. Clear as mud, right? Now, that sounds pretty elementary, sounds pretty simple, but it's actually pretty weighty in our context today. If you don't know where you're going, if you don't know your position, you may wind up somewhere else that you shouldn't even be. Um, a great majority of Christians today, we are, we're trying to get to heaven on our own. Now, I'm going to preach for four hours today. Unless people amen me and agree with me, okay? Yeah, that's better. All right. We'll cut it down then. But uh, most Christians today, we're, they're trying to get to heaven on their own. Under their own power, they're trying to be good enough. If I can just do this and do, if I can say, if I can pray three times a week this week, and and if if I can not cuss but twice this week, and and if I can just do this and do that, uh, I, you know, I can, I, I maybe I'll be good enough to slide in. Have y'all ever heard anybody say maybe I'll be good enough to just slide into heaven? And we try, we're trying to get there under our own power by trying to keep the law. Now remember, I've all, we've, all, we've said for the last however long we've been, we've been here that any time that you see the word law and it's pertaining to the old covenant, you can, you can take that word law and change it with self-effort, Right? So by trying to keep the law, by self-effort, we're, you know, we're trying to get to heaven by trying to keep the law. We're failing. We're failing miserably by trying to keep the law because uh, we're trying to do it under our, our own righteousness and we can't do that. We just can't do that because that would be called self-righteousness. And that's just not how a new covenant believer today is supposed to live under self-righteousness because the only righteousness that is real is what Jesus gifted to us. Now, I've got a lot of scriptures today because I didn't want you to think this is just something that I'm, that I'm, uh, I'm pulling out of a hat. I want to prove to you what I'm saying is the Word of God. So, uh, Romans chapter 10 and I'm going to be reading out of one of my favorites, the Passion Translation. I love the Passion Translation. Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, says, My beloved brothers and sisters, now Paul, this is Paul talking, the passionate desire of my heart and constant prayer to God 
is for my fellow Israelites to experience salvation, the Jews. For I know that although they are deeply devoted to God, they're living good, they're, they're trying to do it themselves, they're trying to abide by the law, they're trying to follow all the rules, even though they are deeply devoted to God, they are unenlightened. Everybody say unenlightened. And since they've ignored the righteousness that God gives, wanting instead to be acceptable to God because of their own works, they've refused to submit to God's faith righteousness. Righteousness by believing and just receiving. God's faith righteousness for Christ. This is, you need to quote this every day, a hundred times a day. For Christ is the end of the law. Christ is the end of self-effort. Christ is the end of me trying to do it under my own power. Christ is the end of the law. And because of him, Jesus, God has transferred his perfect righteousness to all who believe. Believe what? Believe what? That Jesus fixed it. If we believe that Jesus fixed it. Now this is not what I was taught growing up. This is not what Angela and I were taught growing up. We were uh, under a, a very uh, condemnation-oriented yeah. upbringing. A very works-oriented yeah. upbringing. And that we were, all I knew of grace is that was something you do before we eat. Who going to say to grace? Or maybe that we're just lowly sinners. Save my grace. I'm just a lowly sinner. Save my grace. If you've ever said that, shame on you. Because you are not, we are not lowly sinners saved by grace. If you are born again this morning, if Jesus is the Lord of your life, you, your past is no more. Your past is history. It's gone. It don't exist anymore. And that, but but if you see yourself as a lowly sinner, and, and then you don't understand grace, you don't understand righteousness. If you see yourself this morning as unworthy and defeated, I have changed so much in the last year, year and a half, because I saw myself as a failure. I saw myself as defeated. If you see yourself as unworthy and defeated, then you are still trying to live under that law of bondage, of self-effort. And Paul said that you are unenlightened. He didn't say you wasn't saved. He didn't say you wasn't going to heaven. He just said that you are unenlightened. And you're not living to the full potential that you could be living in, right? The grace of the cross broke all of that junk off of you. The grace of the cross erased your past this morning. The law, self-effort says, man, I messed up. I messed up. I made a mistake. I messed up. And man, I sure hope my daddy don't find out. I sure hope my daddy don't find out. I need to go hide so my daddy don't find out. Somebody got a fig leaf. That's what the law says. Grace says, I have messed up. I need to go talk to my daddy. Right? Because Jesus took your guilt. Jesus took your shame upon himself. And he gifted you his righteousness. So you don't have to try to live under your righteousness. He gave you his righteousness. And that's not what I was taught growing up about righteousness or grace. All I knew is your righteousness is filthy rags. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. But you don't live under your righteousness. 
you don't have your righteousness anymore. If you're a believer, you don't have your righteousness anymore. You have his. I was never taught that God, through Jesus Christ, has made me righteous. All I was ever taught is that you're trash. You are trash, and if you don't live up to God's standards, if you don't abide by this rule and this rule and this rule and this rule, uh, uh, then you're going to bust hell wide open. Ladies, you better not wear blue jeans or no britches to church. You better get that makeup off of you. You better get them ear bobs out of your ears. Men, you better cut that hair. You better get rid of them tattoos. You better not be wearing a ball cap in church. Are you going to bust hell wide open? All we were taught, we had to work our way into heaven. It was a works-based religion. By self-effort, the law. And because of that, the church was just as miserable as what the world was. Miserable. There wasn't any joy in that type of teaching. It was all condemnation based. And I think Jesus said, I've came that you may have life to the full in abundance till it overflows. Romans 15 and 13 in the Passion Translation says, Now may God, the fountain of hope, mm, fill you to overflowing with uncontainable joy. And perfect peace as you trust in him. And may the power of the Holy Spirit continually surround your life with his super abundance until you radiate with hope. Does that sound miserable? Does that sound like condemnation? When I finally grabbed a hold of this, when I finally grabbed a hold of the message of righteousness, I was changed forever. If I hadn't, I would definitely not be standing here this morning. I would still be at home hiding, sitting in my recliner and wallowing in pig slop. I wouldn't be here. But I had a real encounter with a real God of mercy and a real God of grace at Cornerstone Church one night and I ran smack dab into a God of love and acceptance and forgiveness. And I realized that God is not angry with me. And He never will be. I don't care what you've done, where you've been, what you're going to do. He never will be angry with you. You know, right after the famous Isaiah 53, we all know Isaiah 53, one one of the most famous passages in the Old Testament. Isaiah 53, where he says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of his, our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we were healed. We all know that. We've quoted it. And we know that Isaiah was seeing, he was prophesying about the future. About things to come. Well then he tells us, you know, 54 comes right after 53, right? Usually. Usually 54 comes. Well, 54 is telling us the results of what's going to happen because of chapter 53. So Isaiah 54, starting with verse 6 in the New King James Version says, For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit. He's called you like a youthful wife when you were refused, says your God. For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. For like this, the waters of Noah to me, for this is, this is like the waters of Noah to me, for as I have sworn, I swear, God is swearing, I swear, for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer covered the earth 
So I have sworn that I would not be angry with you, nor rebuke you. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has mercy on you. God told us right there, I swear, I will never be angry with you again. And my kindness will never depart from you. That is so good. That is so good. God will never, ever break covenant with you. Even though we do. Even though we have. And even though we break covenant with him. He will never, ever break covenant with you. He promised Noah. He said, I will never flood the earth again. We believe that promise, right? Right? We all believe that promise with all of our heart. And he gave Noah a, a sign as a covenant. He gave him the, the sign of a rainbow. And he gave us also the sign of a covenant, the cross. He said, because of this covenant right here, I'll never be angry with you again. You know, a rainbow is not just a half circle like what we we normally see. It's not just a half circle. That's just all we can see. A rainbow, full rainbow is actually a very complete circle. We just can't see all of it. That's just like God's grace. You will never see all of God's grace. God said in this, pack, in this passage, he said, for a moment I had to forsake you. And, a little, and with a little wrath, he hid himself from us. But now we have a covenant of the cross. And he says, I will no longer choose to deal with you in wrath. James chapter 1 verses 19 through 20. New King James. Says, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. Slow to speak. Slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You can't use wrath to scare someone into doing right. Well, yeah. They may conform, yeah. but they're going to conform out of fear. Yeah. Yeah. It's the goodness of God that draws all men unto repentance, and says Romans 2 and 4. Not his wrath. His fear of his wrath may, will cause men to hide. Fear of his wrath will cause them to go hide and grab fig leaves. And it won't change their heart. His goodness, his love, his mercy is what causes men to hearts to change. That's the finished work of Jesus. That's the finished work of Christ, that his amazing goodness changes us. God swears, hand on heart, he swears, I swear by me. He says that by Jesus and the perfect work of the cross, he'll never be mad at us again. That his kindness will never depart from us ever again he said I'll never punish you why why did he say he would never punish us because he's already punished Jesus on the cross for us he's already punished our sins but he did it on Jesus on the cross you don't have to fear wrath ever again. You don't have to be ridden with guilt. You don't have to be ridden with shame. Jesus ended all of that on the cross for those who believe unto righteousness. And that'll mess with your religion if you will let it. Let it. Let it. Because we need to be less sin conscious. The church is too full of sin conscious people. And we need to become more righteousness conscious. We need to be established in righteousness or enlightened in righteousness. Isaiah 54 
verses 14 and 15 says, listen to this. In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression for you shall not fear. And from terror, for it shall not come near you. Indeed, they shall surely assemble, but not because of me. Whoever assembles against you shall fall for your sake. If you're established in righteousness, the enemy might assemble against you, but God says they're going to fall. The enemy may tell you you're unworthy. The enemy may tell you to give up. That neighbor may come to you and say, I don't know how you're still standing. I don't know how you still how you still doing that. I don't know why you just don't throw in the towel. I don't know why you just don't give up. But oppression, depression, fear, terror cannot come near you because you are established and you are grounded and you are rooted in righteousness in position. But most people don't live like that, do they? I made a mistake. Does God still love me? Does he still love me? Does God accept me? Is he mad at me? You're not established. You're not enlightened to his righteousness in you. You are the righteousness of God. Period. Exclamation point. Righteousness comes from an old English root word meaning right standing. Right standing in the word of God means you have the ability to stand before God without any sense of guilt or fear or shame. As if you have never sinned. God chooses not to see you as a forever sinner saved by grace. Righteousness means God sees you as if you have never sinned. Because he sees you through Christ. And he sees Christ in you. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? Doesn't that change the way you look at yourself? That's why he says you can come boldly into the throne room of grace. We're not like the priest of old. We don't have to tie a rope around our ankles when we go into the Holy of Holies and pray that we've done everything right and that we're, that we're clean enough and that we're righteous enough and, and that if we're not, then God's going to strike us dead and they're going to have to pull us out from under the curtain by the rope that's tied around our ankle. No! He says, because when you come into my throne room of grace, I see Jesus in you. I don't see your past because your past is gone. I see my son. So you have the position, the authority to walk into the throne room of grace boldly. He sees Jesus in me. When I walk into the throne room, he sees Jesus. Not Marty. He says, son. And he goes on to say in verse 17 of Isaiah 54, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. He didn't say I would condemn. He said you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. No no weapon that can attack my mind, this this six-inch area right here, no weapon that can attack my mind, no weapon that can attack my body, no weapon that can attack my family will prosper because I condemn that attack on my life. Because I am the righteousness of God and I have that authority. I have that seat of position. That seat of authority. God says your righteousness is of me 
And that might be your past. That might be who you were, but that don't, that's not who you are. Your righteousness doesn't come from you anymore. That would be self-righteousness. Your righteousness comes from him. You need to go home and you need to kick the grave robbers out of your life. Pastor, I love Pastor Tony told that and I loved it. You need to kick the grave robbers out of your life. Those grave robbers that are trying to dig up the old man of the past. That those grave robbers that are trying to dig up the old man and the old woman of the past. And those grave robbers may be physical people, or they may be right here. Or they may be right here. And they keep trying to dig up your past that's not there no more. And verse 7 says, You condemn that. You condemn that. Because you now operate in his righteousness and his authority. James chapter 5, verse 15 and 16 in the New King James. Says, and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The fervent prayer of someone who is enlightened to the message of righteousness, who is enlightened on their position, on their authority, gets her done. It'll make you talk different. Like she said, it'll make you walk different. It'll make you respond different because it accomplishes much. You know, and, and, and all, we've quoted this scripture forever and we have problems and we have things going on in life and, and we'll, we'll quote the word to God and we'll, I mean, to the, our problem and we'll speak the word and that's great to speak the word to God. But, and, but uh, the effect of fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The Bible says the effect of fervent prayer of the righteous man. And that's good. That's good, but, but when, a lot of times when we speak the word to our attacks, we speak out of fear. We speak it out of defeat, which is better than nothing, but, but we speak it out of fear and out of, a feet, out of, def, out of our feet. Uh, out of defeat, that would be a sight, wouldn't it? We speak it out of fear and out of defeat and not out of position, not out of authority, out of our place of righteousness. Not self-righteousness. Right standing. And when you know who you are in Christ and you, and you operate out of that position, that's when you can speak those things that be not as though they were. And you will see the enemy tuck tail and run. And turn loose of that grip on your mind. Turn loose of that grip on your emotions. And, and on your circumstances. I love this next scripture. This next scripture is foundational. It's right up there. It's right up there with John 3.16. You need to know this because it sums up the good news of Jesus. The gospel of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. It says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The Passion Translation says, for God made the only one who did not know sin to become sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God through our union with Jesus. That's so good. You can't do anything to earn this. You can't do anything to earn this. It was gifted to you for believing and just receiving. Our minds, our human minds, we have a hard time receiving something for nothing. Where's the catch? What's the catch there, preacher? That's just it. There is no catch. There's no catch. It factually happened. 
in the physical and in the spiritual realm. He didn't say, okay, if you'll follow me, and if you'll believe, me, believe in me, and, and you, will, you will follow this law and this rule and this rule, and you'll keep all these rules and follow me and believe in me, then I'll just pretend you have right standing. I'll just pretend. And we won't, even though your past is back there and, and your sin is back there, we just won't bring it up anymore, okay? He sent Jesus to die on a Roman cross and Jesus took your unrighteousness and he gave you his righteousness. So you don't have yours anymore. It's gone. Jesus has your unrighteousness and he was punished for it. He took your punishment for it. So don't cheapen it. Your unrighteousness is gone. You can never be judged for it again. You can never be judged for the same crime twice. That would be called double jeopardy. That applies in the physical realm, in the natural realm, and also in the heavenly realm. God is not ever going to punish you for your sin again because Jesus has already been punished for your sin. If you're a believer, paid, gone. The problem comes when you're not established in righteousness or you're not enlightened to righteousness and you keep trying to bring it up. You keep trying to bring up your past. You keep trying to bring up your his, your, the things that you've done, your mistakes, your shortcomings. You keep trying to bring it up to God and he's like, Ooh. what about this time? Lord, I'm so sorry for 1942 when I did this. And he's like, Ooh. What about this? What about that? What about this mistake or that mistake? What about you just get established in righteousness and realize that you are forgiven, you have been pardoned, and that you are the righteousness of God? Amen. He who the Son sets free, it's a little bit free. He is free indeed. You are as righteous as you will ever be. Right now, you cannot be no more righteous ever. You are as righteous as you ever were since you've been saved. Now hold on to your seat here. Take your theology and just for just a second. You are as righteous as Jesus. I heard it on the camera. The people watching live stream. You are as righteous as Jesus. How can you say that, Pastor Marty? Because Jesus gave you his righteousness. How can you not be as righteous as him? He gave you his righteousness. You have the righteousness of God. He took yours and he gave you his. When you stand before God, he sees righteous like you have never, ever sinned. That's so good. That's so good. That's setting me free. I beat myself up because I was a failed preacher. I was a failure. I beat myself up every day. I'm not worthy. But then I got to thank God for Pastor Tony. Thank fuck God he preached this and he taught me this and my eyes were open to righteousness. My eyes were open to grace and I was set free. You stand before God as if you have never sinned. Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 in the Passion Translation. 
Yet, Christ paid the full price to set us free from the curse of the law. Not part of the price. The full price. He absorbed the curse completely as he became a curse in our place. For it is written, everyone who is hung upon a tree is cursed. Jesus became our curse from the law. So you have to decide what you believe this morning. You have to decide what you really believe. Either he really did redeem me fully, he really did redeem me, and then go live in grace and righteousness and go walk in your place of authority and go walk in grace and go walk in righteousness, or he didn't really redeem all of me and keep trying to fulfill the whole of the law, all 600 and something of them, and fail miserably. Because remember Romans 10, 4 earlier said, Jesus is the end of the law. He's the end of the curse. He's the end of the law for your healing. He's the end of the law for your deliverance. He's the end of the law for your anxiety. He's the end of the law of all the curses of the law. He's the end. The buck stops there. And as Angela has been teaching over the last six or seven weeks, you should be able to sit right there and rest and reign. Not only sit and rest, but reign in your place of authority because you're a king and a priest. Romans 5 and 7 in the Passion Translation said, Death once held us in its grip by the blunder of one man. Thanks, Adam. Death reigned as king over humanity. But now, everybody say, but now. now. He's talking to me. He's talking about today. But now, how much more are we held in the grip of grace and continue reigning as kings in life? He wasn't called the king of kings for nothing. Keep reigning as kings in life, enjoying our regal freedom through the gift of what? Perfect righteousness in the one and only Jesus the Messiah. Are you reigning as kings in life? Are you sitting in your place of rest, reigning on your throne of rest as a king? Are you enjoying your regal freedom? Are you struggling in works? Just trying to be good enough. I'm just trying to do the best I can to get by. I've said that so many times. Just doing the best I can. I'm making it. Just trying to be good enough. And some of you may be thinking, but Pastor, but 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 Pastor Marty, what about this? But but what about this time that I did that? But 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 that's your problem. You've got big butts, and I cannot lie. Please laugh at that. I worked really hard on that one. Do I need to wrap it? <laughs> You've got big butts and I cannot lie. <laughs> Those other brothers can't deny. That's our problem. We get, our butts get in the way. But what about this time? But what about the time I did that? But what about the time I was pastoring and I got addicted to pain pills and, and the whole church got messed up and I had to quit and my wife, me and my wife and my family, we got separated. But God, what about that? What That was a big mess up. But, 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 but I am the righteousness of God in Christ and my past doesn't define me. What I did don't define me. Who he is defines me. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. And I refuse to go back to that condemnation mentality. Righteousness and grace will set you free. Fear will destroy you. Condemnation will destroy you. But the goodness of God 
draws all men under repentance. So either you're going to concentrate on your failures or you're going to concentrate on the sacrifice that Jesus made for you. And when you open your eyes to this this righteousness through grace, when your heart is opened and when your eyes are opened to, to this, and you will begin to read the word and you will begin to see the word in a whole new light. Believe me, I know you will. You will begin to see that law and faith and righteousness and grace pop out everywhere. And you will see it in a whole new light. Because see, we've, we've, we've been too sin conscious to see it. We've been focused on our mistakes and on our failures. So we've got to change our stinking thinking and become more grace conscious. We've got to become more mercy conscious, more righteous conscious. Thank you though. Uh, because you were made to be righteous. You were made to be righteous. Genesis, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And then it said, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The very thing that makes God be God, he breathed into man. And then Adam messed it up. Then Adam messed it up. But Jesus fixed it. When Jesus came and he paid the price for us, he made us righteous and righteous just as our original intent, what we were created for, to walk in righteousness with him. Just like in the garden. Righteous. Right standing. Oh, that messes me up. Jesus fixed it. He restored it. He restored us. He made us to be his righteousness. Now, I have three $20 bills right here. The government made these bills. The government, Federal Reserve, the federal government made these bills and they said that they are worth $20 each. That this is what you're worth. You're worth $20. You can buy a hamburger with these. You might can buy two gallons of gas with these if you'll hurry. You can go buy two T-bombs with these and bring me back one of them. Trolley worm. All because the government made them and said that they are worth $20. Because in the Federal Reserve Bank somewhere, there is a gold bar that backs this up. Or there used to be. Used to be. That used to be how it worked. There was a gold bar in the Federal Reserve that says, because I'm worth that, you are worth that. Right? Is that how it works? Like these bills, like these $20 bills, you were made by God because a gold bar named Jesus said you're righteous you were made by God to be righteous in him but see something is wrong with this one something's wrong with this $20 bill this one has it's dirty it's muddy mm. just passed falling all, all off of it this one has been through the mud of life This one has been passed from one slop house to another. Maybe from one drug deal to another. Maybe from one brothel to another. You never know. This this $20 bill has been through 
the mud of life, and it is showing it. It's muddy, dirty. This one, this one's just, this one's been rode hard and put up wet. Feels like it's just about washed up. Feels unworthy to be used anymore because, because its past is way evident on its present. Feels pretty worthless. Feels pretty defeated. This one, this one has been broken. This one's been broken by life. And I felt it when I tore that. I'll get there. Because of bad decision after bad decision after bad relationship after bad relationship. This one has been torn in two. Does anybody want this first one? Well, I ain't going to bring it to you. You're going to come get it. If I'm giving it away, you can come get it. Now, while this one's muddy now. It's dirty. It's nasty. It's been through the mud of life. Why do you want this? You sure? It, now it's, it's muddy, so it, 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 it's still worth twenty dollars, right? Does anybody else want it? Oh, I want it. Uh, he's first. Thank you. This one's washed up. Does anybody want this one? Does anybody want twenty dollars with the gas as high as it is? Now, this one's washed up. Why would you want it? because it's still worth $20. Now, of course, nobody wants this one. It's broken. It's broken, right? Anybody want it? Does anybody want it? Does anybody want it? But it, but it's broken. Why, why, would you, why would you want something that's broken? It's broken. Look at it. It's yeah. the, the decisions of life have torn it in two. Why, why would you want it? Because it can be made whole. Because <laughs> it can be made whole. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter how life has torn you apart. It doesn't matter whether it's chewed you up or spit you out. You are still worth and you are still made to be the righteousness of God. These bills are still worth $20 no matter what they've been through. No matter what the outside looks like. You are still the righteousness of God because there is a gold bar in the bank of heaven named Jesus Christ that says you are worthy because I am worthy. Worthy. I have made you worthy. You are the righteousness of God. He says, You are worth it because I am worth it. And I paid the price for you. Not because of what you've done, not because of what you've been through, not because of what your past says, but all because of what Jesus did on the cross. When you were born of the Spirit, when you were saved, you became just as righteous as you will ever be in your life. Just as righteous as Jesus. Now you can, you can grow and you can mature. Right? We don't stay baby Christians forever. You can grow in maturity. You can grow and mature in your walk with Christ. Right? Uh, you can grow in all of that. But you are as righteous as you will ever be. All because Jesus fixed it that way. Now this doesn't give you the liberty. 
This doesn't give you the liberty to live however you want to. It doesn't give you the freedom to just go through and live however you want to and think that everything's okay. That everything's hunky-dory. Because if you think that, then you've missed the whole point of grace. You've missed the whole point of righteousness. You have missed the whole point of the cross. Because His goodness draws me to repentance. His goodness and His grace and His mercy makes me want to live more like Him every day. It don't make me want to run from Him. It don't make me want to give it. It don't make me want to have an excuse to go pop pills anymore. But it makes me want to be just like Him. Because His goodness is drawing me. So if, 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 you, if you think this is, gives you uh, uh, liberty to just live however you want to and everything's going to be okay, you've missed the whole thing. Because my whole message in a nutshell says the gospel. Go ahead and cut the lights, please. The gospel, the good news, is about unholy people becoming holy in righteousness because of a pure holy, righteous Jesus. But sadly, there is more grace in the world today than there is in the church. Can I say that one more time? (gasps) There is more grace in the world. You can go out there at the bar and find more grace than you can find in most churches. Because most churches in the world today like to operate on baseball righteousness and baseball grace. We'll forgive you, but three strikes and you're out. Here at Summit LC, it's our mission. It's mine and Angela's heart. be a place of restoration to be a place where people can come in that have been broken and been muddied and think they're trash and come in and find grace and find mercy and find Jesus it is our mission to reign like Jesus it is our mission to love like Jesus and to see you walk in the righteousness of God that you were made for and not walk in defeat and walk in fear we choose first and foremost every time to operate in grace God has made you to be the righteousness of Jesus, the righteousness of God. If you live your life beating yourself up, if you live your life condemning yourself, feeling defeated, then you need to be enlightened to the righteousness of God. Because he says, I'll never be mad at you. I can't be mad at you because I've made a covenant and I don't break covenant. Now this is not something I'm, we're, about to, we're about to go into worship and we're about to have an altar call but this is not something that, that Angela and I can call you up, lay hands on you and boom, there you are. This is choices you've got to make. This is decisions you've got to make of what you choose to believe, how you choose to live, and how you start seeing yourself. Now, we're going to open these altars up, and we're going to go back into good, good Father here in just a second, and we're going to worship. We're going to stand up. We're going to worship. But we're going to open this altar up to where if you want to find yourself a spot and you want to get along with God for just a little bit and say, God,